Your life's not over. It's time to reach up like never before. Reach for all that God has for you. Stretch forward your faith. You can do the impossible if you'll dare to believe God. Today is your day for spiritual breakthrough, revelation, reformation, reclamation. If God be for you, who can stand against you? A thousand may fall at your left and 10,000 at your right, but it will not come nigh your dwelling. It's time, body of Christ, to stand firm on the word of God and believe the impossible. Today is your day for salvation. Tomorrow's over. Your past is behind you, but your future is shining bright ahead of you. Lift up your eyes. God is saying today is your day, and if you'll dare to believe me, I'm going to astound you. I'm going to make all your critics' tongues fall out of their mouth. Their eyes are not going to believe what they're about to behold. the dung hills of this life and I am setting you among princes. I'm raising you up to reach a generation for me. See, the key is you got to forget yesterday. You got to forget about your past. It's over. Don't let the enemy remind you of your yesterday anytime. God's not speaking to you about your yesterday. He's speaking to you about your tomorrow. Anything is possible. Talking about Christ. I'll start in verse 9 while you're finding it. Now he that ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Many times I will say things in preaching, I will just brush across really deep theological stuff that you won't hear anywhere else, and sometimes I see people look at me like, you can't even be in the Bible, that none of that makes sense, but it's in the Bible if you read your Bible. I don't want to blow your mind here, but he that ascended also first descended into the lower parts, the word parts there is chambers of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. Notice he says heavens, two, two heavens, plural. What's he talking about? The sky and space, outer space. He ascended up above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Talking about Christ. Didn't Christ ascend? And, and didn't the angels say to the disciples who would soon be apostles, why do you men of Galilee stand here gazing? Because he that ascended will in like manner come back. Right? So we're talking about Christ here, right? Verse 11. And he gave... Some apostles, everybody count it with me on your hand, we'll start with the thumb. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. He gave some, and then he just starts naming out what we think of as titles. But these are not titles, these are anointings that have offices with them. And he starts with apostles. There are still apostles today. Apostles are fathers in the faith. <clears throat> now that doesn't mean someone that's like a mentor or a, you know, that they've been a spiritual father to me. This means someone that has a specific anointing from God to be a, to, to be a special messenger and to help found you in the faith. The first three, apostle, prophet, and evangelist, 
will always have power gifts associated with their ministry. That's why the Bible says that the apostles preached the gospel with signs confirming. An evangelist is not someone who just shows up at your church to hold a three-day planned revival that starts out with 45 minutes of worship and then has 22 minutes of a preacher that's really flashy and then an altar call with a dinner after the third night. But an evangelist is someone that stirs up the hearts of the people to reach the lost in their city. If the evangelist comes and goes and people aren't motivated to win the lost, he wasn't an evangelist. May have been a great speaker. May have been called from God. May hold another office, but he wasn't an evangelist. <coughs> Prophets. Prophecy is the foretelling of things before they happen. There are still prophets. If you've never been around a prophet, a prophet, first of all, you, you won't have the prophetic voice of God speaking in your life until you first submit yourself to the word of God and line up with this. Right. Many of you have never had a prophetic word because you've, you've never submitted yourself to this fully. But when you submit to this, then a word of prophecy will come and the word of prophecy will confirm something that's already in the book. In other words, it's not a new revelation. You don't pay someone $30 or $300 for a new revelation. And more often than not, <clears throat> true prophets will come to you and they will exhort you by giving you some things that you need to prepare to do and get your life in order so that you can receive the greater things that God has for you. That's why most people don't like the voice of prophets. Just read through the Old Testament. Most of them were hated. Many of them were killed. They didn't like them. But the Bible says that our salvation is built upon the foundation of first the prophets and then the apostles. Talking about the Old Testament prophets. And then the apostles. That's what, that's what is the basis for your salvation. The faith that you have is built on that. And we understand Christ is the chief cornerstone. We understand it's, it's built on the blood of Jesus. I'm not taking away any of that. But I'm saying the doctrine that you have. It comes from prophets and apostles. They help institute or install doctrine. You need doctrine. If the church had more doctrine, we wouldn't have so much silly stuff in the church. So we've got to have solid doctrine. How do we get it? By first recognizing the lordship of Christ and submitting ourselves there. God gave some anointings that have these offices. Now the word pastor there and teacher... The word pastor there means sh to shepherd. It means to nurture. It means to help build up. It means to watch out for. To be a watchman that watches for your soul. A teacher is someone that has a special gift to teach. And typically teachers are specialized. They'll have one, two, three, maybe five subjects that they're really specialized on, and they'll, they'll teach on those. And their ministry will be typically a traveling ministry. They will travel and teach. Now, God will raise up sometimes teachers in churches, and they will have a message, a revelation that they know about that is crucial to the development of young Christians. It helps mature young Christians. And God will anoint someone. Now, you can prophesy, but that doesn't mean that you're a prophet. You can help father someone in the faith, but that doesn't mean you're an apostle. You can help shepherd someone else, but that doesn't mean you're a pastor. In fact, I will tell you that I personally believe, now this is my personal belief, but I believe that somewhere between 70 and 95% of all men that call themselves pastors in America, are not pastors. They are teaching elders. Because the word elder means pastor. But this specifically is an anointing to pastor and shepherd people. 
And the shepherd, the difference between the teaching elder or the lay pastor, as we would call them in the Pentecostal church, and the pastor is that the teaching elder or the lay pastor functions more like a sheepdog. They're out there with the people making sure, hey, how's everybody doing? Right, you know, remember what pastor said? Remember, remember this? We got, come on now. We got to strengthen up in this. Whereas the shepherd, he knows the road ahead. He can see that that person's going to get off. He can see that they're off. He can see that they're doing good. He doesn't even have to talk to them. <clears throat> he can tell by looking at them. I can tell by looking at people, especially people here in this church and other churches when I go there. I can just tell by looking at them where they are. And oftentimes their words will present a different picture than how they truly are. But someone that grew up on the farm, grew up around livestock, we raised cattle, we had horses, we had sheep, and we had goats. And I learned the difference between sheep and goats. The shepherd, sheep are smart. They're aggravating. They'll get in trouble. If there's one spot on the farm that they shouldn't be or that they could get hurt, they'll find that spot. They're just aggravating. But if you spend time with sheep, you can go out there and start talking and they'll, they'll come right up to you. They'll follow you right into the pen. They'll follow you right into the trailer. Goats won't do that. Goats have to be herded. And there is, talking about at the end of the age, there is a separation. The Bible talks about separating the sheep from the goats. That's why you should always be doing a self-examination to see whether you're a sheep or whether you're a goat. If you're a goat, you've got to be constantly herded. You've got to have somebody put behind you, pushing you, motivating you, telling you, come on, come on, come on, do this, do this, do this. Don't go over there. They're like, you know, threatening. I'm going to hit you if you go back out. Don't get in the world. <laughs> Every church I've ever been to has some goats. <laughs> We're out of goats right now, thank God. Sheep, not like that. Sheep are sociable. They, they, they want to be around you. They'll come up and rub on you. They're like dogs. They rub on you. Lay with you. <laughs> Talk to you. Goats, they want to jump up on your shoulder. Ram you. Lick your ears. Eat your hair. You're sitting out there. The goats just ate your hat. You come outside for meat and dinner. It's right at dark, and you look, and the whole top of your truck is caved in because there's six goats on top of it. That's what goats do. They're always making a mess. Trust me. They're all, they'll, they'll crack your windshield in trying to climb up on top of your truck. Sheep don't do that. They, they just don't operate like that. They're t totally different animals. And so a shepherd, he knows the sheep. He knows them. He, he, he is an under-shepherd of the great shepherd. And he, he looks at the sheep. He knows the sheep. He knows what's going on. There's a spiritual connection to their eternal well-being that is in the heart of every office-holding pastor. The Bible says, submit yourself to those who keep watch for your soul. Because they'll have to give an account for you on the day of judgment. So see, a shepherd knows. Right? So, this is what God does. He gave some, not all, some. And then he says, here's the reason. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
Did you get that? So the work of the apostle will be in your life until you reach a certain level of maturity. The work of the prophet will come into your life. You'll be touched by prophetic means and measures to help mature you. Then you'll see that gone. Then it'll return as you mature and you're ready for the next thing. The work of the evangelist, the work of the pastor, they're all there to bring you to different levels of spiritual maturity. And they'll remain with you until you're made perfect in the unity of the faith. In other words, until you are with and like Christ. You know, I don't know about you, but one of the most frustrating things in life for me is when you are needing a service or you go up to some type of a machine, maybe ATM, soda machine, Coke machine, snack machine, cash register, maybe even a car, bathroom. You get up there and then there's a sign on it that says out of order. Has anybody ever driven a good distance to get to something only to get there and find out that it's out of order or closed on that at that time and you really wanted or needed that? Is that not aggravating? That is the most aggravating thing. In other words, what you were looking for was promising in its appearance. It looked like, seemed like it would provide relief to thirst, maybe relief to hunger. Maybe medication that you need or supplies or whatever. But you were let down and still in need because what you were seeking, for, seeking was out of order. And when something is out of order, what does that mean? It's not working properly. It doesn't fulfill its purpose. And, and it can't operate according to design. It's not operating according to the design of the manufacturer. And if you've been here in this church for any amount of time, you've heard me talk about and mention order, that God is a God of order. I taught on that in depth as we were first starting. You know, when you start with the book of Genesis and you read creation, you find out the creation event, you find out that God created everything in order. I mean, it, it lays it out there, how he... Creates all this stuff from nothing. In other words, God creates the sky before he creates the bird. God creates the water before he creates the fish. Hmm? God creates all the animals and all the trees and the Garden of Eden before he creates man. He's a God of order. And that order it carries over to the New Testament. When it talks about the church, how services are supposed to be conducted, what positions of authority are supposed to be established. It talks about how we're supposed to act personally and then corporately and then in our community as individuals. And it talks about order. <clears throat> and so if order mattered to God, I think it should grab our attention. And we should make sure that we understand God's order and how to operate in it, how to lock in step with the order of God, the order that he prescribes, because we recognize that if we're out of order in any area of our life, then there's no way that the intended results can manifest in our life because something's out of order. I want to submit this to you. That just like you're frustrated when you try to go to a restaurant or a machine or get a service, whatever that is, only to find out that it's out of order and it can't meet your need, that is how the world feels as it's tried to come to the church at large over the last 30 or 40 years in this nation. And they've tried to find a place that would challenge them to come out of their sin, where the Holy Spirit would convict people, where there were a group of people that weren't perfect but were being made perfect in love, that would not deny, denounce, hold back on the moving and the operation of the Spirit of God, would preach the Word of God and its full counsel. 
and the, the people of the world come and they look at the church and they're looking for relief from spiritual problems. They don't have any peace. They don't have any joy. They're not walking in health. Their finances are a mess. Their family's screwed up. They need somebody to clue them in on the divine order of God and how to have success. But the church oftentimes is in a chaotic, out of rhythm, out of order mess. Because order is not just about getting things lined up. It's also about moving in sync and in order at a rhythm. It's got to be in rhythm. It's got to be the heartbeat of God has got to be beating loudly in every single church. What is the heartbeat of God? Souls, souls, souls. You are here on this earth from the moment that you were born again. Your purpose and everything about you shifted. And you are here to plunder hell and populate heaven. You are here to worship the one true and living God. You are here to raise your family in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. You are here to stand against evil and to stand for righteousness in your generation. Hallelujah. I found out yesterday that my ag teacher, growing up, Mr. Joey Austin died at 62 years of age. Hated that. I was saddened last night as I was reading. And I was reminded of a quote that he often told us. <clears throat> By the way, I saw Mr. Austin stand against evil and what I know now is the spirit of the age as it tried to come in and wreck our little school there in northeast Arkansas. And he confronted that evil in the form of a woman controlled by a Jezebel spirit every single day. I saw him do it. He was constantly ticked off and raising cane around that school. He was telling everybody, this is out of order. When I, the, 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 he would come to class, he said, well, they've threatened to fire me again. I've said, just go ahead and get it over with. I'm tired of you threatening, but until you do, I'm going to keep telling you. That's not how we need to run things here. I need to teach young boys how to become men. And his favorite quote that he always said to us was, One man makes a difference, but every man should try. One man will make the difference in every person's life, but every man should try to make the difference in every person's life. You might not be the person that makes the difference in someone else's life for them, but you should be trying. Do, do you get it? And so we've got to come into God's order if we're going to see the blessings of the kingdom of God unlocked. We've got to come under God's order if we're going to see the atmosphere of heaven released in our homes and in our lives because the church is not a building. The church is not a, not a gathering. The church is not a production. The church... Is not a show to see how many people we can get in on Sunday morning. That's not the church. Christ was never worried about numbers. In fact, when he had the multitudes there, they were with him as long as he was feeding the 5,000 and performing miracles. But when it came time to train up disciples that would later become apostles, he had to lay some heavy doctrine on them, and everybody left but the 12. And Christ wasn't phased by that because he knew that all he needed was 120 to change an entire world. Amen. That's all I'm looking for here. I'm looking for 12 people that will come under the order of Christ and forsaking everything else, having a made-up mind, say, I'm going to stand in the order of Christ. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if it's popular. I don't care if anybody else likes it. I don't care if people quit inviting me to Christmas parties. I don't care if my family gets mad. I don't care if it costs me promotion or a job or I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to stay where God wants me to stay and do what God wants me to do regardless of anything else. Because if we can get 12, I think we got that. Before long, there'll be 120. 
And as we reach 120, <coughs> we can look for an outpouring and a manifestation of the presence of God that will rip through this valley, and it won't take long. It won't take long. It won't take long. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I could set, by the way, I'm teaching tonight on this. Set up for success. Are you set up for success? Or are you just flying your own kite in your own way and hoping for something good to happen? Because nothing, there is no coincidence in the body of Christ. There's no coincidence on the earth. Do you realize in order for there to be a coincidence, that would mean that there had to be something that caught God off guard. You understand what the word coincident means? I didn't, oh, I just, it was just a coincidence. No, no. There is nothing that has ever caught God off guard. So there is no coincidence. One word, coincidence, you'll never hear in the realm of the kingdom of God. The other one is luck. There is no luck. There's no luck. Luck is really a, a superstitious word that comes from witchcraft. It actually comes from the Druids. That's why it's called the luck of the Irish. There's no such thing as luck. There's blessing and there's cursing. And remember, Job, the Bible says, was a righteous man. He was perfect in all of his ways. And in the conversation that's recorded between God and Satan... Satan says, yeah, I know about Job, but I can't even get to him. His hedge is perfect. I can't even come to him. I can't even mess with Job because he is so in order that, that I can't even mess with him. Can I tell you that when you get under the lordship of Christ and you get your personal life in order, you begin to bring your home in order, it doesn't mean that trials and storms won't come your way. It doesn't mean that life won't happen to you. But what it means is that if all hell breaks loose around you, that a thousand may fall at your left, and ten thousand may fall at your right, but it won't come nigh your dwelling. That you have your foot on the rock and your mind made up and it doesn't phase you. And, and though the winds may blow and the seas may toss about around you and the winds may come and threaten to blow, blow your house down, blow your life off track, you will somehow find a grace to remain solid. And it won't last long. That might last for a season. But remember, morning lasts through the night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. That it will be a quick season. Hallelujah. I prophesied over you. I'm telling you from the word of God. That you won't know lack if you come under the order of Christ. You won't know sickness in your life and in your body. Your children will never know demonic possession. Hallelujah. Fear won't grip the hearts of the people in your family, in your sphere. Because you'll walk above that. You're under the order that God has. Rick Pitino wrote a great book in the 90s. Everyone should get it and read it. The title is worth the price of the book. It's called Success is a Choice. My dad used to say, son, I've learned. The harder I work, the luckier I get. Now, he wasn't saying luck. We didn't say words like that in our house. But what he was telling us is that good things happen to people that wake up early Show up with a good attitude, work hard, and then go home and repeat that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm telling you that success is a choice. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ wants to catapult you from needing a miracle to being the miracle. Yes. Right. He wants to found your life upon this word. He wants you to get a hold of it. He wants you to grow in that. And then he wants to systematically, through his word, solve every issue and every crisis in your life. And then he wants to send you to the point of need so that you're functioning like you should. And then when the world comes and says, hey, I'm looking for somebody, then they find a true Christian and they're not out of order. But they're hooked up to heaven and it's flowing through them to the world around them. That is God's plan and purpose for the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I could go and talk for just a few moments about finances and how that if you're a tither 
And if you bring offerings unto the Lord, the first fruit, the alms, there's, there's six or seven different types of offerings that are talked about all the way through the Bible, even in the New Testament. And as you begin to honor the Lord in your giving, and Pastor Brian is doing such an incredible job of teaching during offering time. Thank you. But as you begin to honor the Lord and put him first in your finances, first, that means when I get paid, I don't spend anything else until I first pay my tithes. Yeah. Amen. I take my tithe out first. Yeah. It's out. Well, I don't know how to do that. I just got to it's electronic banking. It's first in my heart. No, it's got to be first in your action. Yeah. Set up two bank accounts. Transfer it. Take it out in cash. If you get paid the same thing every week, get your tithe ahead. Whatever it takes for God to be first. He's got to be first. Yeah, honoring the Lord at the first of the year with a first fruits offering. We have this thing in this country called income tax. And that's where the government steals money from you all year long and hopes that you can catch it and get some money back in your income tax. My wife and I, we don't get any money back in our income tax because I don't want to pay the government enough that they're holding it out and they give money back. I don't trust them suckers. They're giving me my money back. I just prefer to keep my money. But if you get income tax, nothing wrong with that. If you get it, that's an excellent opportunity for you to honor the Lord at the first of the year with the first fruits offering. And so, because remember, the root governs the rest. Hallelujah. I mean, you got to believe that God has brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, that he purchased you with the price. Yes. And just because you're a Christian, that doesn't mean that you can just read the Bible and lose weight. You still have to work out to get in shape. Yes. You still have to go to work to make a living. Yes. But what it means is that the blessing of the Lord is cumulative. And the way you increase in the kingdom of God is first the, the stalk, Right? Then the, then the ear. Then the full kernel on the ear. It happens over time. Oh, it's quiet in here right now. But you should already be thinking about what God wants to do for you in the new year. You should be saying, God, I want to, be, I want to give more. God, I want to go on a mission trip. God. I, I, I want to get underneath Pastor Brian and figure out how to start raising up teams of people in this region that are going out and reaching people. I, I, I want to get with these folks, and I, I want to get something, learn something, grab something from you, and I want to work for your kingdom because that you got to work while it's day. Just look over at your neighbor and say, work while it's day because the night comes when no man can work. Did you hear me? The night comes when no man, we have so lowered Christianity that it's, well, are you saved? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Yep, I am. Great. Come join my Christian club. We've got live nativity. Come join my Christian club. We've got great music. Come join my Christian club. We have dynamic youth programs. And I'm not against any of that. But your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life is the Ticket, the entrance to a life that is greater than. And you want to be working for the king because the king is soon to return. And every man will know you there as you are known here. And you can't afford to just sit by on your laurels and wait for something good to happen. It's not about me being blessed enough to get through. Now, when I preach like this, some people just get, they, they get all hair lip. Don't get upset. If you're here and you're, you're young and you're just starting your family, look, I get it. You're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. You're starting your family. Your time is more limited, but your purpose is not limited. If you're here and you're a senior citizen and, and you think, well, how can I ever do, do a whole lot more? I don't have the energy, the back, this, that. Listen, I'm not saying, you know, at 75, you should buy tickets to Chile and become a missionary. But if the Vincents told me they were, we'd support them. You know what I mean? 
I don't know if they like Southern gospel music in Chile, but we could find out. <laughs> I've never had Chilean food, but if it's anything like Mexican food, I might be called down there. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm one of those that could wake up and eat burritos, go to bed and eat burritos. That's it. Chips and salsa. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we've got to come underneath the order of Christ in our lives personally. Because, see, as a pastor, I'm not looking to get other religious people from other churches to come join our church and then somehow by, you know, a lot of manipulation try to keep those people happy so that they'll tip God occasionally with a little bit of what should be their tithe. I'm not interested in that. If I was playing that game, I wouldn't go to West Virginia. I go somewhere people got money. <laughs> Nothing against West Virginia. I love it here. But I mean, you know, mama didn't raise no fool. Right? I mean, if you're wanting to start a car dealership, it's probably not good to found one in the Arctic Circle with the Inuit Indians. They're probably not going to buy many. A snowmobile dealership would probably do better up there. You know what I mean? You might want to raise and breed sled dogs. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So I'm here for a purpose. And my purpose is to teach the whole counsel of God and to give you what the word of God says. And you will be held accountable for the truth that you know. That's why many people flake out. They're not here. Because they couldn't stand the weight of what was being given to them, they knew that they were going to have to stop playing around, stop goofing around, stop screwing around, and really serve the Lord with gladness and do what God is calling them to do. But this is the most rewarding life. I mean, Christ is not a slave master. I don't get up in the morning and think, oh my God, I've got to do all this stuff for you. No, That's what religious people think. You know what religious people think? About their pastors, what pastors should be? I'll tell you. Let, let me see if I can find it. I, I wrote this down for another message, but I'll see if I can find it. Uh, where is it at? Help me, Lord. Where is it at, Lord? I know it's in my notes, Lord. Help me to find it. Because they want to hear it. In the Pentecostal church growing up, if there was more than you know five seconds of silence, people would like go into travail with their hands towards the pastor. Help him, Jesus, Lord! <laughs> Not that big a deal, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It never worked. It just put more pressure on the guy up there. Trust me. The guy that was up there just got really freaked out when they did that. Here it is. This is going to be it right here. I think. No, that isn't it. Anyway, I'll find it in a minute. But people think, you know, it's the old adage. The pastor should, you know, Make $500 a week, give $450 back in tithe, drive a nice car, wear nice clothes, buy nice books, live in a nice home. He should work 26 out of 24 hours a day. He should make 20 house calls while simultaneously being in the office to take everybody's phone call. He should always have a smile on his face while also being solemn. Above all, he should be handsome. You know what I mean? This is what people think about pastors. They have an un religious folks have an unrealistic notion of that. That's not how Christ, he's not, he says, come into me all you that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take upon my burden upon you because my burden is easy. My yoke, it's light. That, that's how he is. So when you sell out to him, it doesn't bring more frustration into your life. 
the part of you that feels that when somebody's preaching like this, that's the part of your flesh that you haven't crucified yet. Because when you crucify that part of your flesh, it'll no longer be you that lives, but it'll be Christ that lives in you. And it won't be about your will, but it'll be about His will. And you won't want all the things you used to want. You'll want what He wants. Hallelujah. Oh, this is what, this is what God's looking for out of His church. This is how the church can expand rapidly in this generation. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. See, I want you blessed. I want you out there healing the sick. The gifts of the Spirit, they don't just operate inside the auditorium. They don't just operate when a special speaker comes. The gifts of the Spirit, they operate in the mall. They operate in Walmart. That's the Redneck Mall, for those of you that didn't know. That's the Redneck Mall of America. It's Walmart, okay? And if you were in a different part of the country where there was much less, you would find that all the teens assemble in the Walmart parking lot at night because everything else is closed and there's no lights. They just hang out in the Walmart parking lot. Lord, how'd we get there? Mm -mm -mm. See, I want you to get set up for success. I want you to live in the overflow of heaven. I promise you, growing up, we had trials. I promise you, we had storms. We had, we, we had things that came against us. Sometimes they were spiritual. Sometimes they were mental. Sometimes they were relational, familial. You know what I mean? Like in the family. Sometimes they were physical. I never knew my parents to be sick growing up, and we were never sick. But we would have like injuries, stuff like that. They would come against us. I mean, even in the denomination we were in, there were pastors coming up to uh, Y2K that were freaked out. They'd call my dad. My dad evangelized in all their churches, trained their horses. They would call and say, Bradford, what are you going to do with these computer chips? Quit working. You got any beans? One guy said, I, I've got four storage containers. They're all welded up. They've been buried in my yard. I think I'm going to add some more. I've got one. I'm just plumb full of food. Beans. You know, he just died. I don't even think he ate all the beans and rice he had in there. <laughs> in 23 years, he didn't run out. What are you going to do, Bradford? He said, I know what I'm going to do. If everything quits working, I'll just keep right on farming. Right. Well, he won't have any income. I won't need any. I'll have more time to farm. I'm just going to keep on serving the Lord. We never hiccuped. I mean, the greatest thing that happened on a weekly basis as far as our family, besides our devotion time, our prayer time, we had such joy. I mean, I, like we laughed all the time. And like the highlight of the week was when all the chores were done and dad would go by. Now, if you were in a bigger place, they had Blockbuster. We didn't have Blockbuster. We had like Corey's Corner Movie Rental. We'd go home, mom would make something. Dad would cook outside on the grill in the dirt yard. Mom would make nachos. You'd wash it down with a two liter a piece, something. We'd hang out in our house. It's just true. I never worried what anybody else was ever doing, I didn't care. I never wanted to be like anybody else at school. I didn't care. I never spent the night at their house. And they rarely, less than five times, spent the night at my house. And I didn't care. We had a party line. And besides that, we were holiness. So I didn't talk to anyone on the phone. I remember in fourth grade, I had just switched from the Christian school to the public school. And there was one girl that really liked me. She bought me a 24-karat gold necklace. Like, they had some money. She started calling my grandmothers after school. My mom and dad were at work, but see, my mom was able to quit her job and just focus on us. And she'd be like, where's Jordan? He's on the phone. That was back when you had the one phone, you know, when, and, and then the, the, had that miracle cord. You know, it scrunched up to where it barely touched the ground. But you could go plumb over to the neighbor's house on that thing. 20 foot. 
Yeah, there was power in the blood, and besides that, the second most powerful thing was the elasticity of that cord. <laughs> you could shut it indoors. It never did get free. It's amazing. They can't make an iPhone charging cord that lasts more than six months. But back then, you'd get 50 years out of a crinkled up thing. You could slam it indoors, take it out back. You could cook with it over. <laughs> never quit, man. I mean, that phone would be so, the little holes in the receivers would be so clogged up with makeup and stuff. I mean, they wonder to God that thing ever, we'd squirt it down with bleach, alcohol, whatever, toothbrush, <laughs> use it again, never did quit. <coughs> now you pay $1,500 for one of these and you're lucky to get three years out of it. And my little girl started calling me Jamie Beck. My mom found out about two weeks in that. She said, why is that girl calling you? I was in there on the couch, incognito. Yeah, what are you doing? Fourth grade. What are you doing? I've been home 20 minutes, you know. Uh, going to start my homework. Grandma's making dinner. Yeah, what are y'all having? I don't know. My mom goes in there. Who are you talking to? Get that. You ain't, uh-uh. Remember, you ain't marrying no woman of the world. You ain't being unequally yoked. Give me that. Jamie, he ain't going to be allowed to talk to you no more. Psh, hangs it up. Then she found the necklace. She said, take that necklace off. You ain't wearing that. Brother Voss wouldn't like that necklace on you. We don't believe in that. Okay, here you go. No problem. <laughs> I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's how it was. I'm not saying you should do that. You shouldn't do that. Now, you should protect your children. And fourth grade's too young to think you got a girlfriend. Right. 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 And I'm thankful my parents watched over me with that stuff. Right. Right. But fourth grade's also too young to watch YouTube by yourself. Yeah. Right. Or anything else. Or, or look at the phone. Yeah. By, it's too young. Yeah. But you know what? We went home, and there were many times my dad worked two or three jobs, and, and we had next to nothing. It's true. We were the largest givers in our church, and nobody knew we were watering down the milk at home to have something to drink. Dad got laid off. This happened. The job wanted him to start working on Sundays or Wednesdays, and he said, I'm never doing that. So, but, but I never felt like I was poor. In fact, somebody would bless us, and we would have like all the Christmas clothes that everybody else wanted, we'd have them. I, I just felt like I was... I mean, I felt like, I hope everybody else's life is half this good. Because mine was the greatest ever. And there was a peace and a security so that when I got older and I started making my own decisions, and I made decisions that I knew in my heart were not pleasing to God or that they would dishonor my parents, I felt the safety and the peace and the protection of God waning in my life. And I knew, oh, don't go down that road. Bridge is out. Get back over here underneath the spot where the glory comes out. Get your life in order with what God has for you. Thank you for listening. Make sure to subscribe and give a rating. To learn more about our ministry go to bradfordministries.net